We're going to be talking today not about thematic analysis, although we may occasionally uh, add reference to that potentially. And of course, if there is a question relevant to that, we may be happy to answer it. Um, there's a good time for Q&A at the end, and I just want to say we really appreciate the length that there is for that, because we always tend to get lots of questions in these um, sorts of seminars. Uh, so today our focus is going to be on good practices and reporting qualitative research, and I think it's really important to start by situating ourselves and where we come from and our backgrounds and, and why we're doing what we're doing this. So both of us um, come from a, a an almost total background as qualitative researchers. You know, we've never um, had to or really by choice done much or anything with numbers or quantitative research and our training is in qualitative. And we also come from uh, critical and feminist perspectives. And so with an interest in kind of issues of social justice and power and inequality in relation to research. And that's a really nice, I think, um, overlay with the sort of interests that um, theory has as part of you know the the research that's done there. Um, so I I'm a New Zealander. You can potentially tell from my accent, not Australian. Um, I um, did my PhD here in the UK, which is where Victoria and I met. Um, and Victoria's um, English and um, we did our PhDs at Loughborough University. Um, but then I went back to New Zealand and have been at the University of Auckland ever since. And since 2006, as you noted, we have been dabbling in and increasingly dabbling in um, methodological thinking and methodological writing. And our sort of focus and interest in this have evolved over time. And But what I guess unites it and guides it all is this interest in facilitating um, people to do the best qualitative research they can in the context that they're operating and recognizing that not everybody comes from the kind of privileged background of a lot of qualitative research training and experience that we have both had. So um, I we are going to kind of talk through um, different aspects of what um, to us in terms of publishing and reporting quality and sometimes we'll be talking about publishing and sometimes reporting and those things kind of mesh together but there are particular aspects and pressures to think about in relation to publishing itself or reporting itself uh, we will be I guess the crux of the talk will will focus around this notion of congruence and ideas and how things can be done congruently um, and we will also spend a bit of time um unpacking and thinking about this this aspect, qualitative research. So all of these um, elements are part of the sort of scope of our talk today. Um, but and, and we have a kind of an idea for a logical flow of this, that we will first talk about the kind of context and the, the pressures and opportunities of publication and reporting, and then some of the problems and challenges, and then what we've come up with in terms of some of the solutions, and hopefully lead um, everyone feeling uh, empowered to position themselves and understand what the particular challenges might be um, in terms of quality. And although this is sort of nicely separated, it is a bit more interwoven throughout. So the first the first thing I really want to kind of um, start with is, is the kind of, I guess what to us feels a bit like a conundrum. We have a situation where qualitative research is more widely valued, utilised, practised, desired, accepted than probably ever before. There is so much qualitative research that's happening. Um, and yet at the same time, um, there are all sorts of tensions and challenges that go along with that. Um, and I think this quote um, from the latest handbook of qualitative which Victoria and I um, were very lucky to have a chapter in the latest edition on thematic analysis, highlights what they call the contextual challenges of 
um, qualitative research, they say challenges still remain despite this groundswell of support for and use of qualitative methods across the ideological and paradigmatic spectrum of inquiry. As higher education continues to reflect a neoliberal corporate commercial approach to research, scholars face a mounting bevy of accountability and performance indicators, hurdles and roadblocks. So we are in a situation where we are encouraged to do more qualitative research. Qualitative research is more valuable. But one of the things that um, one of the pressures of um, doing good qualitative research is having enough time to do it. And time is, um, of course, something that um, is a precious commodity in a neoliberal academic context. And many of the pressures of the neoliberal academic context work against many of the aspects that make qualitative research of the sort of best that allows it to be its best thing, allows us to do it. And there are other kind of aspects related to this as well. So we're all familiar with concepts of publish or perish, and we're all um, familiar with um, like the ideas that we have to um, publish our research in high quality or high ranking outlets. We have to have high impact. We have to um, do the most uh, important research we can across often a wide range of sometimes intention um, criteria. And some of these aspects don't sit well with for qualitative research or present particular challenges to qualitative research. So for instance, I think journal impact rankings and factors, depending on your discipline, um, those that are of higher impact or more value in the discipline may be the ones that are much more of a challenge to get qualitative research published in. So we, we're often sitting at a kind of um, point of tension as qualitative researchers thinking um, about writing. And I think this is a particular um, tricky navigation point for, for people who are early career or in their PhDs or in, in sort of precarious um, or unstable employment situations in academia because you're having to kind of navigate this particular environment and make all these sorts of choices around what's going to be the best you know way to get your qualitative research report reported and, and published and um i think the the thing that we want to really convey across this talk is that you know we always make choices and sacrifices and contingencies and and when we publish and in the decisions we make and what we're hoping to do is convey guidance that allows those decisions to be ones that allow the qualitative we re research we do to still be of the best quality, to be kind of congruent with itself, to not sort of um, inadvertently introduce um, a range of different um, elements into that process. So we're going to um, mix up our, our presentation. So I'm going to do some, um, and Victoria's going to do some. And so now I'm going to hand it over to you, Victoria, to talk a bit more about the context. But Ginny's going to operate the slides, so I feel like I'm in a COVID briefing when I can say next slide, please, and it will magically appear. Um, and just to note as well that Zoom is very determined that I update the version of Zoom on my computer, so I keep getting pop-ups. So if I seem a bit distracted, that would be why. Um, so let's also think about one of the kind of constraints around publishing and reporting in terms of the structure of how we report research. This is something that's been very live for me recently with my undergraduate students coming to their um, submission deadline for their undergraduate projects here in the UK and trying to squeeze qualitative research into this kind of traditional reporting format. And there's a fantastic paper by the US communication researcher, Sarah Tracy, where she talks about the limitations of traditional reporting formats for research and the way in which, and I'm, I always stumble over pronouncing this, the hypothetical deductive model of research has kind of shaped how we report research. So it's constraining for quantitative research is kind of not working in that way, but also incredibly constraining for qualitative researchers. So she talks about the four act play of research reporting where we have an introduction or a literature review, we have a method section, we have a results or a finding section and we have a discussion. And the logic of writing this, not just the structure but how we write it sort of maps onto and is informed by hypothetical deductive approaches. So in that traditional kind of research format you will review the literature, write your introduction, from this you will develop your hypothesis 
hypotheses. From your hypotheses, you'll pick the methods to kind of test those. You'll give an account of your method. You'll run your statistical tests. You'll report the outcomes of these, and then you'll kind of bring it all together and interpret things in the discussion. And it's really both that format, but also that imagined way of writing a report is really constraining for qualitative researchers. So the discussions I have with my students is you're still going to have these four bits, but you're not going to write them in that order. You're going to, you might think about kind of making notes on the literature and starting to think about some of the things you want to put in your introduction first, but then you're going to do your study and then you'll come back to write this. You can't write your method before you do your study because you don't know exactly how it's unfolded until you've done it. So you can't follow the instructions that quantitative researchers might for kind of writing. And so Tracy raises the question of whether this style of reporting works for qualitative research. And it's it's a really interesting piece because she makes a kind of provocative and interesting suggestion that actually we should structure journal articles differently for more inductive approaches. So she's using the example of grounded theory, which is a very inductive approach. And she suggests that the way we report should map onto the way you do a grounded theory. So you have this initial kind of engagement with the literature and then you have the the study and what you found and you come back to the literature and a bit more of the study so it's a really interesting um provo provocation because it gets us to think about actually what she's proposing seems a bit strange but it seems strange because it's so alien to us because we're so used to this default way of kind of reporting qualitative research so next slide please jen And another constraint as well when it comes to particularly journal publishing is length. The word count limits, page count limits are very much oriented historically to quantitative research and qualitative research just generally needs more space. It needs more words. Um, and this is a really nice discussion from um, two papers led by um, Heidi Levitt. So one outlining the JARS qual, so the journal article reporting standards for qualitative research that are part of the kind of APA, American Psychological Association guidance for kind of reporting research. They've um, finally acknowledged that APA norms perhaps aren't a good fit for qualitative research and develop their own guidance for reporting qualitative research, but also introduced a concept of methodological integrity, the idea that good qualitative research, a hallmark of good qualitative research is methodological integrity, which we'll talk a bit more about in a moment. But in this whole discussion of thinking about how we go about reporting qualitative research, they've really emphasised the problems of traditional journal article formats in terms of length constraints and that qualitative research needs more words you need more space in order to report qualitative research well and with integrity so um, they support the recommendation made by the society for qualitative research in psychology which is part of the um, american psychological association of an extension of at least 10 pages for qualitative research and they give the example of the journal of counseling psychology which has already made that kind of recommendation um, i think it's rare i I haven't come across many journals that have different word counts for kind of qualitative research, but it is definitely one of the struggles of publishing qualitative research is fitting it in within the constraints of kind of word limits and doing a good job within those constraints. So lots of checklists and reporting standards around reporting qualitative research. What they're signposting is you, just, you need more space in order to report qualitative research well, transparently, adequately, and provide all the relevant detail. So one very pragmatic suggestion that Levitt make is that we use um, supplementary material online. So if the, we don't have the space we need within the constraints of reporting qualitative research in to particular word or page limits, that we use supplementary materials to add in more detail. And that's something that um, Ginny and I have we've advocated for and we're starting to do you know well, we say we should do this and this is a good idea so we should start doing it ourselves um so putting additional kind of information on supplementary materials you know things like interview guides participant information sheets all that kind of supplementary stuff that you might put in a thesis or dissertation kind of appendices but we actually think is useful to support the kind of transparent and open reporting of qualitative research <clears throat> 
Okay, next slide, please. But another big question that we need to think about in the context of reporting and quality is what we mean by qualitative research, because it's very easy to use this word and assume everyone holds the same understanding of it. So lots of times when you go looking for definitions of qualitative research, you'll see that people reference the idea of qualitative research as being interested in lived experience and subjective experiences, which Virginia and I um, trained in critical psychology doesn't really resonate because that's not where we sort of started or really kind of got going on our qualitative research journals. It wasn't with an interest in lived experience or subjectivity. It was very much an interest in kind of social discourse um, and social construction, and that doesn't fit within that kind of definition. So when we are thinking about reporting quality, we really need to kind of unpack what we mean by qualitative research and what it is we're referring to when we use this term. Next slide, please. And if we look historically at attempts to kind of map out the diversity of qualitative research, there are lots of different ways in which kind of people do it. Um, and we've kind of surveyed a kind of few of those. This is by no means kind of um, every attempt to kind of map out qualitative research. So a very kind of well-known mapping is Creswell, and I believe he's a sociologist from memory, um, that this was done quite a while ago. Um, so it was initially biographical, but now narrative, phenomenologically, phenomenology, I always get the word wrong, um, and then start thinking about the Muppets. If you know what I mean, you'll know what I mean. Um, grounded theory, ethnography, case study. So here it's sort of a mix of theory with phenomenology and also kind of methodology in terms of mapping out qualitative research. This is still referenced to this mapping. So you see it all over the place. Um, there's an interesting review done recently, I think by Bradbury Jones and colleagues that looked at um, research published across several journals and they found that most research doesn't fit within this, this mapping. So even though this mapping is still used, it doesn't seem to capture the kind of contemporary terrain of qualitative research. Then you have other mappings of qualitative research that focus at the level of kind of paradigm. So um, a very popular one that you see an awful lot that I think is based on Patty Lather's kind of work is post-positivist interpretative radical and post-structuralist kind of paradigms. So splitting the qualitative terrain into different paradigms. Um, and um, the SAGE handbook of qualitative research that Ginny mentioned earlier, from the very first edition of that book up until the most recent edition published this year, there's been a really interesting chapter that's got bigger and longer and more complex over time, kind of mapping out the qualitative terrain in terms of different kind of paradigms and kind of theoretical frameworks, which is somewhat similar to the kind of lather mapping. Um, another mapping that's quite interesting is from the social psychologist Steve Reichler talking about experiential and discursive or critical qualitative research. So a simpler mapping in that it's dividing the terrain into kind of two areas, experiential research covers qualitative research that um, is interested in participants kind of sense making and comes at it in quite an empathic way and treats language as a relatively straightforward tool for kind of accessing participant sense making. And then on the other side, you have discursive and kind of critical qualitative approaches, which have a very different orientation to language and treat language as kind of active and performative and kind of creating realities rather than simply transparently reporting on realities. So Riker's distinction is a really interesting one because it isn't about paradigms as much as it's how we think about language in qualitative research. Next slide, please. So, and these are just these are just a, a small sample and in inverted commas of ways people have attempted to kind of map out the field. Another one we quite like is um, Anna Madil and Brendan Goff talking about fuzzy sets. So there's kind of these different kind of methods and approaches and schools and clusters of work within kind of qualitative work. But as Denson and Lincoln kind of pointed out in 2019, it's really the nature of qualitative research kind of works against kind of having neat definitions. Um, 
and it also works against the idea that it's one thing that you can um, say qualitative research is essentially a paradigm, a whole kind of way of working, and it's relatively kind of uniform and homogenous. And um, the psychologist Anna Medill has a great paper, I think it's a commentary responding to something else, but the title qualitative research is not a paradigm. So she's kind of making the point that qualitative research isn't a singular paradigm, it's more diverse and it's more kind of complex than that. Um, next slide, please, Jen. Um, but there is a distinction that we find useful and we think these distinctions are helpful tools for kind of getting into the messy terrain of qualitative research and thinking about some of the differences between different approaches and a distinction we really like that we've kind of we didn't realize until we went back and read this paper kind of recently how much we've kind of developed it we've been attributing the everything that we've written about it to the um, authors um, Kidder and Fine but in actual fact we've kind of developed it quite a bit but didn't realize that we'd done that um, so they make a distinction between what they call small q and big q and um, which you can see from is quite different from the other mappings but for us particularly from our discipline of psychology we find this a really helpful distinction um, because historically um, psychology has been very dominated by positivism and the tentacles of kind of positivism are kind of everywhere in psychology and they're very much felt in qualitative research and so we like a distinction that highlights that so they say small q well they and we say small q is qualitative research that is defined in terms of the use of qualitative techniques so it's a kind of proceduralist definition you're doing qualitative research if you're doing interviews if you're using qualitative content analysis or TA to kind of analyze your data and that's how you define qualitative research it's through the through tools and techniques and what we've observed is when people define qualitative research in that way they don't really think much about the ontological and epistemological and methodological aspects of the research the theoretical grounding of the research what they do is just do what they're doing and they tend to sort of default to positivism to default to the kind of dominant way of thinking about research values within the particular kind of discipline or area that they're working in whereas big q qualitative we can see it as um sometimes people kind of talk about it as fully qualitative research in the sense that it's about both techniques and procedures so doing interviews doing ta doing grounded theory whatever but it's also about the values that inform the research so it's about some of these kind of paradigms that are captured in some of the other mappings so it's about the the, the value frameworks that have been developed for doing research and the value frameworks that have been developed to use these tools and techniques within and we find this definition really useful for kind of thinking about what qualitative research is, what it isn't, and how qualitative research can kind of differ from each other. So this is the framework that we tend to use. And Big Q would encompass everything that isn't positivist in terms of qualitative research. So it's a kind of big, messy camp uh, where you have critical theorists, constructivists, interpretists, phenomenologists, all kind of mingling together. So I'll hand back to you, Jen. Thank you. Um, and I realised that um, I, I meant to say at the start that we were also going to be focusing on, I guess, to some extent, what is a, a somewhat um, normative idea of qualitative research. And we're not really going to be touching on some of the kind of um, additional developments that are popular in some domains, such as kind of post-qualitative and um, different um approaches to inquiry which uh, challenge um, some of the things that we'll be talking about and ask bigger questions and maybe maybe relevant and useful for thinking about but will be on the scope of this talk so just to kind of acknowledge that those are, are there in the mix or on the side or in the background um, and um, so I'm gonna now move on and I think um, to kind of segue from what Victoria said the small q big q um, concept is a really, really useful one for thinking about disentangling some of the challenges that can happen in relation to questions of quality and to sort of get to the heart of what some of the issues around congruence might be. So we're going to really, this is the sort of 
second part of the talk, we're going to be focusing on um, highlighting, I guess, and moving towards an idea that we've found quite useful, which is a kind of an idea of knowingness, by which we mean a kind of recognizing that what you're doing is a situated and particular practice and understanding what the limits and opportunities of any practice that we do. So any method that we use, any tool that we use, any quality standard or measure or criteria that we use is, a, is always going to be situated in some way. And so we talk here in this slide, we sort of signal congruence or knowing incongruence um, to highlight that we're not necessarily um, going to be sort of saying these are a set of rules that you have to follow and this is the one way to think about quality, but rather to kind of highlight a positionality where question positionality and and a kind of orientation to thinking in relation to it with the caveat that as I've already pointed out at the start acknowledging that of course the context for publication and reporting present all sorts of um, challenges and we will talk um, more about those challenges in this half of the talk so um, I said we may talk about TA specifically one of the things that we've been doing in the last few years is um, looking at how TA methods get used in practice. And we've done a number of reviews, um, all broadly related to health, um, but we don't believe there would be much radical difference if we looked in other disciplines such as education. Um, and what we've um, done is select articles published within either a particular journal or a particular field. So health psychology, we looked at, I think it was five journals in the end, and the others were all looking within a specific um, publication. And then we've evaluated, you know, what people have claimed they're doing, what they actually do, and looked at what we would see as, I guess, evidence of really good practice and evidence of what we would see as problematic practice. And we found, um, I think, that there is a real patterning in the types of problematic practice that we have um, understood from looking at this extensive kind of review process. And these problematic practices sort of can be categorized as broadly conceptual or methodological, or as uh, practice-based. So conceptually, um, there might be um, misunderstandings or misrepresentations about what the method is or what the method involves. Um, and there might be conceptual or methodological mismatches between the types of claims that are made or the positionalities or descriptions of theoretical frameworks and so on. Um, there is also those conceptual mismatches can also um, occur between some of those more practice aspects as well. So when we talk about practice, problematic um, practice elements, we're talking about both the ways they use the approach and then the ways that they reported what they did and so on. And we will talk more about this in a moment, what some of those sorts of things are. But this process of reviewing, reflecting, considering led us to question, led us to questions of, you know, trying to get to the nub of why this might be. And, you know, for us as methodological scholars, I think it was sort of, and, and ones who have written a lot of guidance and where we've tried to be kind of as clear as possible, I think of, it's an important question for us of going, how is there such a mismatch between um, what we have sort of described, advised and so on, and then what gets published um, and, Ex including when it gets attributed to people who say they are sort of following our guidance and our advice. So how can this kind of situation come to be? So always driven by curiosity, we led to this, we led into or, or sort of lent into these questions of why. And we we speculated, I guess, we did not hypothesize, but we speculated or explored. And part of this also came from anecdotal evidence and our own experiences that some of this might come about through methodologically incongruous reviewing. So reviewers making 
claims and statements or demanding practices from researchers that are uh, methodologically incongruent, that don't align, but which the the author is advised or required to include in their reporting practice. And we have a project on the go about that. So hopefully um, in, in a few months' time that might be submitted and we might um, have that um, published study relatively soon. And to kind of give a brief um, synopsis of that, yes, methodologically incongruous reviewing is a practice that people are having to navigate. Um, and then we also have kind of, I guess, honed in on thinking about what are the quality requirements or expectations that people are being subject to when they go about reporting their research. And this is not, um, these two things are not separate. Obviously, these two things overlap. Um, so this refers to things like what kind of criteria are being used to assess and evaluate um, Research, um, what kind of criteria do people themselves understand as relevant and important? Um, and um, how do those standards get deployed or not? And I think for us, a fundamental question is, you know, as Victoria has referred to, these kind of tentacles of positivism. How do people recognise the tentacles of positivism that may be shaping the context of quality requirements or reviewing processes and how do they then resist them? So there's these two kind of challenges. So um, I think, you know, so that led us really into thinking about quality criteria and so on and reflecting on these kinds of processes and practices. Um, and I guess coming back to that kind of point about knowingness. So um, instead of sort of going, okay, there's a quality standard, it's been developed, that's good, I'll, I'll sort of adhere to it, actually kind of thinking about does this work, does this work for the paradigmatic, ontological, epistemological orientations and assumptions of my research, does this work, and thinking about how important that is um, to hold that questioning orientation. So when we think about quality, we can think about things like checklist. So some journals, and particularly in some disciplines, are really kind of leaning into the idea that you need to have a checklist set of criteria. Um, and the inference of these is that there are a series of definitive measurable items or practices that you can demonstrate that you've displayed them. There's almost an inference that the more the better, so that if you haven't done something, um, you've done something wrong or that your research is of a lesser quality um, rather than perhaps that it's just um, an inconsistent practice that you shouldn't do. Um, in the area of health, um, the consolidated, I can never remember what the abbreviation stands for, COREC or COREC, the Consolidated Reporting Standards for Qualitative Research, it's something like that, um, is really widely used as a checklist and, you know, just Last month, I had a colleague email me going, I've done some reflexive TA and they're asking me to complete a correct compliance checklist. Uh, this doesn't feel right to me. What's your advice about that? So that's that's not a question that we have never had before. That is a question that happens. And so I think, you know, even just in a, a sort of um, positionality experience as authors, if we're faced with something like this, we have to come to what we've done from a position of otherness and defensiveness. We have to defend what we do against what is assumed to be a kind of best practice standard. And so that raises all sorts of challenges because um, we've also also been involved in doing a critique of COREC, um, which is also in the publication process. And, and COREC is really um, problematic from a big Q qualitative point of view. Um, there are also um, all sorts of um, there are all sorts of checklist standards. There is, I think, one research study identified well over a hundred different standards and and checklists and things like that for qualitative quality. So it's a field which has kind of flourished. Um, standards, is, you know, potentially operate slightly differently to um, checklists, and um, perhaps the one that is most sort of relevant is the one Victoria has already mentioned in our discipline, the JARS-QUAL, the Journal Reporting 
standards for the American Psychological Association specifically oriented to qualitative research. And they have lots of really nice aspects about them, including kind of, I guess, highlighting um, concepts of methodological integrity, which we'll come back to in a minute. Um, but the idea of standards do still evoke some kind of ideal um, or a level that you should meet. And um, I think, you know, we're both trained in, in fine-grained analyses of language, and for us, language really matters. Standards um, can also contain, and Giles Qual does still too, contain some sort of assumptions and positivist inflected norms that are hard to disentangle. So, you know, it's easy to critique these from um, the outside. So um, Victoria is going to talk about why um, we didn't just critique in a minute. Um, but I'm going to move on to talk about briefly um, why these sorts of things are a problem. So um, it might seem like um, having uh, reporting standards or guidelines um, like Giles Qual or checklists like Corec is a really good thing because it gives people in uncertain circumstances clear sets of guidelines. Um, but what we've um, what appears to be happening is that the kind of over reliance and perhaps rigid application of these criteria tend to lead to uh, methodological incongruence. So there does tend to be a sense in which these things appear to be applied in an unknowing way or an unthinking way or in, in an unquestioned way um, based on certain assumptions and values which don't get called into question and which don't necessarily apply in relation to big Q in particular qualitative research. So we've already talked about these positivist tentacles and the tensions that they produce within psychology. And I think, you know, talking about our field for a long time, there's been this, um, I guess, you know, speaking in very kind of overall terms, quite substantial differences between the type of qualitative research that tended to be produced in the US, which had had a very sort of strong positivist tradition and influence, and the type of qualitative research that came out of places like New Zealand and the UK, which often had a much more kind of um, big Q qualitative foundation. That's, that's gross generalizations, but um, I think it sort of highlights the ways in which disciplinary traditions and disciplinary practices can create both explicit values, as we might get in checklists and guidelines, but also some of these more implicit values that produce ideas that we don't even necessarily question. And um, there's a critical psychologist in the US, um, Jean Marashek, who has this great quote about psychologists, qualitative psychologists in the US, um, I can't even remember the quote now. It's something about swimming in, in, the, in the pool, in the lake of positivism and not even realising that they're wet. So they are being saturated by this thing, but they're not even realising what's going on. Which kind of evokes the idea that you are, you are getting, um, you are being shaped by the context that you're in with all sorts of implicit values as well as the explicit ones. So we really sort of, I guess, gave ourselves um, a disciplined task of going, you know, are the, are the practices, the quality practices that we are encountering and which trouble us, are they congruent with big Q qualitative and trying to think through where and how they might be and where and how they might not be. And we are absolutely not alone in this. There are fantastic scholars across a wide range of disciplines who are also doing this kind of research. And so some of the some of the um, practices which we see kind of coming into research that don't align with, for instance, reflexive thematic analysis or big Q qualitative um, necessarily are things like saturation um, as a kind of measure of data set adequacy or triangulation through different data sources or the use of multiple coders um, to establish intercoder agreement or consensus. Um, in the coding approach, or member checks as a mode for validity. And these are 
misaligned with a big Q orientation because they are foundationalist and invoke some kind of objective truth through what is being accessed through the research process. And they tend to position researcher subjectivity as bias and as bad. And there are qualitative or big Q qualitative iterations of these. Um, so some have suggested that you can replace data set or data saturation as a, as a claim for um, your the value of your data set uh, with a notion of data set sufficiency or information power. Um, triangulation uh, has had none other different other variations approach, but one kind of qualitative approach suggested was the evocation of crystallization as a metaphor rather than triangulation as a metaphor. Um, the notion that you might have multiple coders as a real tension point, like in reflexive and big Q approaches, it's quite common to just have the one person doing the research. And so you can't have intercoder agreement with yourself, even if it was conceptually aligned. But um, Brett Smith and others have talked about the notion of having critical friends, so people who kind of might engage in discussion with you about your developing and elaborating, elaborate on your analytic process. But the point isn't to establish the single truth or the agreement or the truth of your coding. And finally, um, member reflections as a notion has been offered up instead of member checking. So it's not about the truth of your analysis and the validity of it by a sort of stamp of approval from participants, but a more kind of reflexive and collaborative process. And all this kind of highlights and signals the both the importance and what we often see as the absence of reflexivity. Um, and by reflexivity, we're not talking about kind of a list of identity positions or a sort of dispassionate consideration of the strengths and weaknesses of the research but rather a kind of considered an interrogative orientation where both your person and your practices and research are things that you, that you consider and that you understand yourself as a sort of producer of situated and subjective and contextualised knowledges and that you yourself are part of that knowledge production process. So we have developed an understanding that there's lots wrong through what things like checklists and standards and so on can encourage and through some of the pressures on the reporting process. But at the same time, because everything is complicated and there's no simple story, guidelines themselves can be useful. And we want to sort of highlight that they can be useful in two ways. They can be useful Practically, they can be useful for people who are learning to do qualitative research, who are thinking through qualitative research, who are reviewing qualitative research. And I forgot to say earlier, but reviewers are not necessarily expert in qualitative approaches. We know this is a particular challenge in some disciplines. So practically, they can be really useful in guiding processes and practices and getting us to think more and getting us to be that more kind of positioned, knowing, critically reflexive researcher. But they can also be useful rhetorically. They can be useful for getting us to argue back. So when somebody says, why didn't you use saturation to determine your data set size? You know, a guideline which specifically explains why um, saturation is not an appropriate criteria and why something else is can be a very useful tool for arguing back. So. All this and our tangle of questions and frustrations and our desire um, to improve our, I guess, both qualitative research in general and our engagement in supporting qualitative researchers through the writing, writing we did, led us to a position where we, not entirely comfortably, but still um, embraced the task of thinking through what's the, what might work for us as qualitative research guidelines for big Q qualitative. So I am now going to hand you back to Victoria, who is going to talk to you more about this. So um, 
we may live to regret this, but we decided to have a go at doing big Q qualitative reporting guidelines for qualitative research. Although there's lots that we like in the JARS qual, the Journal Article Reporting Standards for um, Qualitative Research in Psychology, we felt that because historically US psychology has had strong sort of positivist roots that the standards kind of mingled together kind of positivist and non-positivist qualitative research in a way that's kind of unhelpful for supporting non-positivist qualitative research because the guideline the standards rely on authors reviewers and editors being able to disentangle those two strands and to be able to make judgments about whether saturation is applicable to a piece of research or not, or whether another concept kind of applies. And those are quite high level kind of decisions. So we felt that there was the potential for these reporting standards to kind of contribute to the kind of incongruence that we've been talking about rather than supporting kind of congruent reporting of non-positivist qualitative research. So we decided to bracket all our questions and ambivalence with these kind of tools because obviously as soon as you try to codify something it can be interpreted as rigid and prescriptive and qualitative methodologists who are very much in favor of a looser and a fluid approach to qualitative research can get quite irritated with these kind of things um, so I put a, um, a critique of Corrick in the chat that um, conveys some of that irritation that some qualitative researchers can feel with this kind of thing but what we decided to do was do something that that centered values. A lot of the tools that we've discussed that Ginny's mentioned, CORIC, um, SRQR is another one, that they're built through um, a consensus methodology. So the idea is you look at the quality standards that are already out there, you look at the common elements and you pull those into one set of kind of reporting guidelines, quality standards and so on. So the idea underlying that, that kind of development is that if lots of people agree saturation is is a meaningful practice for qualitative research, then it is a meaningful practice for qualitative research. And that for us doesn't quite work because if 20 researchers agree that saturation is meaningful for all forms of qualitative research, it doesn't magically make saturation meaningful because saturation has particular values and assumptions and ideas kind of embedded in it. And they don't magically become, I don't know, theoretically neutral or trans theoretical just because people agree that it is a useful construct so we wanted to develop a set of reporting guidelines and we use guidelines rather than standards or a checklist to kind of signal that they're kind of suggestions and invitations rather than anything rigid they're an invitation to, of things to consider in a kind of knowing way rather than um, you must do this and if you do this your research report will be good so we wanted to start off with values we wanted to start off by thinking about does this fit with non-positivist big q qualitative research if it does then it has a place in the reporting guidelines if it doesn't then off it pops um, so we're centering values. We're also centering this concept of methodological congruence, lots of different um, ways of kind of phrasing this. So um, Levitt and colleagues talk about methodological integrity, um, other terms in the literature and methodological coherence. We've kind of used that, but we kind of like congruence because the opposite methodological incoherence kind of sounds a bit rude. Um, so we've gone towards kind of methodological incongruence as our preferred term but there's paradigmatic congruence and so on but what they're getting at is the different elements of the research kind of fit together conceptually that they're harmonious so that for example if you are taking a critical or discursive approach in your research that that's reflected in how you treat language so you treat language as kind of performative and constructive that there isn't a sort of a often we're as kind of critical and constructionist trained researchers we see people claiming to take a constructionist approach and then they treat language as just reflective of people's kind of lived experience and we have a no that's not that's not 
how we conceptualize kind of language as constructionist researchers. So methodological congruence, we think is a really important way of thinking about the quality of qualitative research is making sure all the different bits line up together. And that really requires the knowingness that Ginny was talking about, the thinking through, does this fit? Does this make sense with my research, with my values, with my paradigm, my epistemology, my ontology, and so on. And another thing we think is really important is what we call reflexive openness, which which kind of translates into the idea of transparency, where you're being open about the decisions and the choices that you've made and where you're communicating the kind of detail and the messiness and the complexity of kind of your research. And so these three things kind of guided the development of the Borg, which for some reason I'm started to call Björk rather than Borg, but there we are. So it's not a checklist because it's not requiring compliance to every single item and um, they're not sort of items that you need to tick off. They're kind of things to think about. It's not standards because we're not kind of, you must do this thing. And if you do this thing, your research will be good. Then, as I said, there's sort of invitations and suggestions for things to think about, things to think about whether you include them or not. And obviously, non-positivist qualitative research is huge diverse and messy sometimes it has participants sometimes it doesn't so writing one set of guidelines that covers all those possibilities is really tricky and it will inevitably reflect our experience and our positioning so we have written this into a paper it's currently under review at the moment so um, that's why we're not kind of sharing it because it it might not exist it might not be a thing but one thing we've done in that paper is we've spent quite a bit of time talking about our background and our training our experience with qualitative research because we think it's really important that people who are developing these kind of tools are able to articulate their values their approach to qualitative research their assumptions and their background so the reader can evaluate how those have informed what they're seeing so as we've already mentioned very much about values very much about um a nice set of quality guidelines, problematic, but also really nice from Robert Elliott and colleagues in clinical psychology. They talk about owning, researchers owning their perspective. We've kind of changed it to owning perspectives, plural. And also we tend to frame it as a striving that because it's not something that you arrive at. It's a kind of an ongoing process. You know, we're psychologists and so we're very aware that um, self-insight is always partial and kind of tentative as human beings. So the idea that we arrive at kind of fully owning our perspective and then boom we're done um, doesn't quite work so it's also centering um, the big Q kind of approach that we talked about so this is very specifically oriented to non-positivist qualitative research qualitative research that's about tools and techniques but also about values and about specific kind of qualitative traditions so this tool isn't for small Q qualitative research it won't work for small Q qualitative research and it will probably encourage incongruent reporting for small Q if we think about what the values are of big Q, it's really hard. I mean, if you've got sort of 20 big Q qualitative researchers in a room and said, come up with a list of your shared values, and you went back three hours later, they'd still be arguing. Kind of, We, we know that's the case. But I think probably people might be willing to sign up to the idea that the values of big Q are that knowledge is always contextual and situated, that we're not striving for a singular truth and objective knowledge, that we're developing partial knowledge and multiple truths rather than singular truths. So next slide, please, Jim. So in terms of the concept of methodological congruence, this really requires a knowing researcher. So to make those judgments about is the way I'm thinking about what my data represent, what I can get at through my data, what I can access through language and how I'm theorizing language, does that all match up with what I'm claiming my epistemology or ontology or methodology is? Does that all match up? It requires knowingness. It requires a depth of understanding. So we realize that we're asking a lot of researchers that it's not sort of a once over lightly approach to qualitative research or just dabble in qualitative research. It requires a commitment to read, to think through concepts, to not just um, someone tell you, oh, you've got to saturate. Saturate's the gold standard for thinking about um, um, 
sample size and inverted commas in qualitative research it's not just accepting that received wisdom but actually kind of thinking it through for yourself and thinking through does this work and the good thing is if you can think of a concept you will find a dozens of papers on it there's loads of papers on saturation there's loads of papers on member checking all these kind of quality concepts that are touted as being universally applicable to all forms of qualitative research some qualitative methodologist has kind of sat down and worked it through and thought about it and does it work and so there were great papers on pretty much everything that you can think about that help us do this thinking but it does require a kind of commitment to reading to and thinking and working through rather than just taking kind of received wisdom. Um, so knowing this, we think is crucial for avoiding um, incongruence, um, what we previously kind of talked about as kind of um, incoherence and making sure that we orient to quality standards that are conceptually kind of appropriate for our research. So the crucial thing, the kind of crucial kind of take home message here is that quality practices, quality standards, quality criteria, quality checklists, whatever you want to call them, they are very rarely theoretically neutral. So CORIC has particular assumptions embedded in it. CORIC defines qualitative research procedurally. So it defines it in terms of methods, doesn't really engage with theory presents concepts like saturation, as Ginny has mentioned, as kind of universally applicable to all forms of qualitative research. And so as researchers, we have a responsibility in order to achieve kind of theoretical congruence to kind of think through these things and just not accept the kind of received wisdom in the discipline, which is, you know, we recognize it a hard ask with all the kind of pressures that are on, on everyone. So next slide, please, Jim. I think because the next one's such a long quote, why don't we uh, turn in an example? Why don't we jump through to the where time's at? So I'll skip across from that quote, um, okay. which is a lot of reading onto this one. Yeah, no, I wasn't going to read it out. It's just, um, and we'll share our slides so you can look at the slides if you want. It's just an example of us doing that work that, you know, we're not just saying, go off and do this stuff. We're actually doing it ourselves. So in a, in a book project, we were asked, do you really want to use the word data? Um, and so we had to think through that because um, lots of qualitative researchers don't like the word data. And the one suggestion is we use kind of empirical materials instead. So alongside methodological congruence, there's this really important idea of reflexive openness. We have used transparency in the past, and that's a term that's very widely used in the kind of methodological literature, the idea that Qualitative researchers are kind of explicit about their values, the choices that they've made, what they actually did in their research. Um, but we like the kind of idea of reflexive openness. We think kind of conceptually, so kind of thinking through that congruence, it's a better fit with kind of big Q qualitative non-positivist research. And it's and it also brings and centers kind of reflexivity into that process of kind of transparency the idea that we're constantly engaged in a process of kind of reflecting on and questioning our practices our decisions and assumptions and being able to kind of articulate that for the reader and also to move towards the kind of mess of kind of qualitative research and reveal that kind of mess a little bit more so i will hand back to you jen for the final final Thank you. So really, um, we just wanted to kind of wrap up by signaling what 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 is on offer with the with the Borg. I have not adapted Bjork as the way of describing it, but we just we like the idea of Borg. So if anybody doesn't get the um, older Star Trek reference that we had with that slide previously, that's what it is. Um, and it amuses us too because the Borg were all about assimilation and this is an argument against assimilation. Um, so the, um, the reporting guidelines, um, the, the Borg, um, are not rules, they are recommendations and those recommendations describe good practice, they have offers of suggestions of things that are useful to do, ways to present and offer the research that um, conveys um, the 
I guess, gets to the heart of what it is that you're trying to do as a big Q qualitative researcher. Um, but what we also do with the, um, with the guidelines is offer up a whole lot of practices that we think um, are often encouraged through reporting processes or the norms of discipline. So we've kind of also got a list of these are things that are good to just not do unthinkingly. Sometimes to come back to our point of about um, knowing incongruence, sometimes we may do those things with a good explanation and a good re reason to demonstrate why. Um, and norms in the discipline that we might disrupt. So one of the things that you know might be a, a disruptor is to look at ways to resist that for act play reporting structure. So we increasingly recommend that instead of having a separate results and a separate discussion section, we have an analysis section which combines the two that works so much better for the most part for big Q qualitative research. And then a smaller, shorter discussion or conclusion which brings it all together. So when this paper is hopefully accepted and published, you'll see that we have a discussion of overall practices um, and then we've organized it into sort of practices and reporting things that are specific to the different elements of a research report. And we have maintained a four-act play structure, albeit a slightly different one. So an introduction, a methodology, an analysis, and a discussion or conclusion. And that is our current preferred terminology um, for these sections of a report for Big Q Qualitative. But as Victoria has as has noted, these things are always in, in transition and partial, and maybe in a year or two's time, we might have different language that we prefer to come to. So um, we are not going to go into the detail of that. Nobody's um, brains have the capacity to hold all that in place, but instead we wanted to just finish up then with the opportunity for um, questions and discussion. And um, thank everybody for their attention and participation. Thank you, Jeannie and uh, Victoria.